Um, well, today I want to talk about overcoming by the nature of the lamb. I want to, I want to start with, you know, vision. You know, and one of my joys in life, and, you know, you could say it's a vision, is, is dad jokes. I love uh, corny dad jokes. And, you know, come starting next week, we have a very rare opportunity. It'll never, ever, ever happen again in history. And that is sayings around 2020, like 2020 vision. So, hey, use it up, because in 2021, you're not going to be able to say that again. So, um, so today I want to talk about our vision, you know, getting a vision in 2020. Um, not to sound dumb, but I'm going to use it. So, you know, there are, there are three groups of people around vision. There are those who don't have a vision. They're just kind of going through life aimlessly. I would say that's probably 98% of, of the world. Um, the other two have vision. I would say 1.75% of those have vision, but it's misguided. And what I mean by that is it's, it's worldly things. Um, and then the rest of the 0.25% are driven by God's vision. And so, you know, you think of like, I remember, I guess it was a couple years ago, we were at the pool. We have a lot of like really cool God conversations in the summer around the pool, and Brian and Tim and I and John and Steve and uh, Dad, we were talking about, um, you know, vision and our, our life's vision. And, you know, at work, we have these things called BHAGs. They're big, hairy, audacious goals. I know it's a dumb saying, but they're all centered around, you know, business-type things. Um, and, you know, we huddle around. We, we want to do something that's crazy, a, a crazy goal. And the beauty of that goal or having a goal is, you know, you achieve something, but the, 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 the depressing part is once you achieve it, there's, it doesn't satisfy, it's fleeting. Um, you know, and so we were talking, like, we don't want to be those people who have these really crazy goals that the moment you, you, you encounter it, you lose it. I mean, think about, like, uh, you know, next week's the college championship. Whoever wins, they're going to feel so much excitement and just passion and joy for about 24 hours, and then it'll begin to wane and wane, and then three or four years after that, yes, they remember that feeling, but it doesn't have the same effect. You know, and I don't want to be one of those persons who goes through life and doesn't, is not satisfied. I want, a, I want a vision. I want something that matters, something of eternity. And I feel that this year coming up is that God really wants to sharpen our vision and give us focus, and give us a vision for something that's our life's vision, something that's unattainable in the natural, but a, a, a focus that we live the rest of our life through focus and intense determination to see, to see, that, um, to see that come about. And I remember uh, when Noel used to he'd come here, he used to say, we're in a time of time and a season of season. And I feel like we're, we're in one of those now where where God's really wanting to um, allow us to be part of something very great. And not all of us will. Um, you know, this vision that, I, that God wants to give us is, is what we've been talking about. It's the inward life, but it's, there's purpose and there's context, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, this, this, this vision, what God wants to do, will make us people who are unoffendable, who we cannot be offended. Who wants that? I know I do. You know, it'll, it'll give us incredible joy. It'll give us endurance like nothing else. Um, it'll cause us to, you know, grow in love and just be filled, filled with love and, and that we don't have to wait to eternity to enjoy God. We can experience him now in a real tangible way. Um, and, I, and I know, you know, we see the world getting darker and darker around us. And just to kind of highlight a few things, um, I don't know how many, or I know most of the people, most people here are familiar with Terry's 20, 21 year vision that the Lord gave him. But if you're not, I want to, I want to go over that real quick. Um, in 2001 or 2000, I think it was 2001, uh, the, he had a, he had an encounter with the angel Gabriel. And I remember when I first heard that, I was like, right, sure, sure he did. Um, you know, but then after you meet him, you're like, oh wait, yeah, he really did. And, and <laughs> You know, I was like, this guy's for real. And um, anyway, in this vision, this is in 2001. He said, starting in 2008, there's going to be a seven-year period of uh, financial crisis. 
And followed by that, the next seven years will be a, a, a series of governmental crisis. And then followed by that in, uh, will be another seven-year period of religious crisis um, that will ultimately bring to the culmination of, of the, the landscape of the, of the world before the Lord returns. And what happened in 2008? The financial crisis. What's happening now? You know, the governmental crisis. I remember a few months ago, I was like, yeah, it's been kind of intense, you know, but it hasn't been like that punch. And that day, President Day announced the impeachment of President Trump. And I'm, or I'm like, okay, this is, this is real. And I feel like the Lord's using that to get our attention. Um, you know, like, if you look in Revelation, there's 21 judgments. And not to compare this to Revelation, but I think the principles is very similar in that, you know, there's 21 judgments in Revelation. And they get more severe and more severe and more severe. Basically, they're more in your face, more in your face, more in your face. And I, I feel now that what's going on with the government is way is more intense than the financial crisis. And maybe that's just part of it's just being because it's now and it wasn't, you know, um, however many years ago. Um, but what's coming next is a wave of, of deception. Um, you know, the, the religious part of that component is a is going to be marked by a great falling away and a and a bringing together of a one world religion. And it is going to be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly deceptive. Um, you know, and we don't want to be those people who are swept away by the flood of delusion coming. And so the way to do that is to pursue the life and pursue the overcoming, the overcoming uh, lifestyle. You know, and many years ago, God called us to be forerunners. And, you know, we, we, we always hear that a forerunner is kind of a cool thing, but what is a forerunner? Like a forerunner to what? And you know, if you think about, if you look at, you know, the last 20 or so years, you know, we've been in this stream. Okay, we're in the, you know, the spiritual warfare stream. And now we're in the Israel stream. And now we're in the end time stream. And now we're in the evangelism stream and the signs and wonders. And the forerunner ministry, when it talks about John the Baptist, it said that he would make the crooked way straight. In other words, he would bring context and bring all the little pieces. They're like a little puzzle piece. It'll bring them together into one. And the forerunner ministry is to bring context and clarity to God's purpose and God's plan. So, like, if you think about, you know, God's eternal purpose as, as, as the plumb line is to bring things in alignment to that. I know we've talked about that um, you know, I know we've talked about that many, many times. And, you know, when you, when you look at, like, the body, for example, uh, let's take, you know, like the spine. When it's in proper alignment, things work, things function. When it's not, things don't. And so, you know, God, has, he, he, he's getting us in proper alignment. And, you know, the min our ministry is to once, you know, get in line ourselves, but then to prepare others, um, you know, to get in line, Right. So what I want to do now is kind of go through, kind of, re, you know, some of this is going to be reviewed, some of it's not, and then kind of set the context to, you know, how do we, how do we get this vision? What are some practical things, you know, we can do? Um, you know, the delusion that's coming, right? Jesus said that there will be great delusion, great deception, there will be wars coming. And what did he describe those as? He described them as birth pangs. You know, so when a woman's given birth, the, the pains come before the birth, right? And we always read that, read that growing up, okay, the birth, the birth, the birth. But has anyone ever asked, like, what's being birthed? Like, where, where is, where's, what's a being birthed? Like, where is the, where is birth, like, something being born mentioned? And, ha, huh, let me tell you, Revelation 12. Um, Revelation 12, it talks about a birth. And so I believe these birth pains that, the Lord spoke about in the Gospels is pointing to Revelation 12, the birth. So we're going to review this. We're going to go through it. Um, this, this is a passage of Scripture that has caused much controversy. A lot of people just look at it and they're like, this is just so much going on. I think it means this. Move on. It's not that important. You know, but in the beginning of Revelation, it talks about, like, if, if, you, if you really dive into this, you, there's a blessing that comes to it. And, you know, God, I think the, the deeper truths, the deeper knowledge of God's word, like, if you just look at it on the surface, you're not going to get 
the benefit of that. But if you really like wrestle with stuff and try to go deep, there is a tremendous amount of, of treasure there. And I feel like this, this is that, I think. You know, I know when we first heard about this, I remember the first time I heard it, I thought, I mean, it was null. We're like, what in the world are you talking about? This is like so crazy and insane. And then over the years, it's like the Lord began unveiling and unveiling and unveiling. And so let's, let's, let's go through this, talk about what, what is actually the whole story, what's happening, and then we'll, we'll break it down a little bit. I know we have, I'm not going to go too far in depth because we have, you know, Brian's written volumes on this, um, and we, we can find out. Um, no, it's, it's great. Like, he, I, I, I used some of it uh, in, in, in preparing this, like, and I applaud Brian for, for going through this. I mean, it's great. Like, I don't think, like, one of the things I was reading yesterday, I don't think there's any, anyone has done this, like, ever, you know, and it's like, he spent the time to do it, so thank you for that. Um, you know, so in Revelation 12, there's a woman in heaven, okay? She's about to give birth. And before her, there's a dragon who's about to, um, to dev devour the, the child. Um, a male child is born, is then immediately caught up to God and to his throne, and it will rule the, the world with a rod of iron. Um, Right after that, there's a war in heaven. Michael and his angels, they throw down Satan. Satan is then thrown to the earth, um, and he goes against the woman who just gave birth. But God protects the woman, and then he goes and wages war with the rest of her offspring. Okay? A lot of stuff going on there. So let's, let's break it down. The woman in heaven. You know, Galatians uh, 4, it talks about our mother, Jerusalem from above, right? And in that context, it's, 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 um, it, it says, you know, the, the woman who is, who is barren will, you know, have child. Basically, like, God will bring forth, uh, God will bring forth out of something that is barren. And so, the, the woman in heaven is, is most likely, it's, it's the saints throughout history, you know, the, the great cloud of witnesses, um, you know, and a lot of people, when they read this, they say the child is Jesus. Um, you know, and there's, there, I don't want to, I mean, there, we have a whole series, Brian's in a whole series on this, and goes into more depth, but just real high level, um, you know, Revelation 1 says, this is the things that are going to take place in the future, so this is in the future. Um, you know, the word child there is, is the Greek word uh, technon, and, and we, know, we, we know from, you know, the, the, um, the studies we've done, there's technon and weos, and uh, Jesus is only referred to in, in, as technon one time when he was 12. Um, you know, so this is technon, so it's not even the same. Um, and then it talks about, later on in that passage, is that they, 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 they overcame. So it's context of a corporate uh, company. Um, also, the, the description of Satan is the description used in the end time about the uh, the seven heads, the ten horns, the seven diadems. Um, you know, so this, it, it also talks about the ruling the nations with a rod of iron. It talks about that with Jesus, but it also, the overcomers in Revelation, is it two? And Thyatira, about um, ruling the nations with a rod of iron. So I, 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 I feel really strongly this is not talking about Jesus. So if it's not talking about Jesus, then who is it? And I believe it's the overcomers, um, and we're going to keep going and you know give some more uh, some more information to to back that up, um, you know. But there's a war in heaven, and so Michael and his angels they overthrow the enemy. And I, I just you know when we were in worship, I, this just came to me and how like I bet that is like the moment that Michael is living for, because if you think about when he was fighting. Uh, or when Moses died, and I guess the, it then talks about it in Jude, and he said, the Lord rebuke you. Like, he was in submission to the Lord. He wouldn't dare do a railing accusation against, uh, against Satan. But here he gets to, like, he's the company who overthrows, who overthrows him. And it says the accuser has been thrown down, and he's been cast to the earth. And I think at that time... At that time, 
like, I can't imagine what the heavens are going to be like. Like, the accuser, all the noise, the spiritual noise that we, we, we encounter is all down on the earth. And the earth is going to be filled with violence, but the, um, but the you know, the, the heavens will be, will be clear. Um, and, you know, the woman then, oh, sorry, then it says that the kingdom of our God and authority has come, Right? Salvation, like the, the kingdom has come. The kingdom has come. And we see in this, in, you know, a few cha- or a chapter before about the seventh trumpet, it talks about the kingdom of God coming. So the, the culmination of everything happens with that coming up of the man child. Um, the woman is then protected, and I believe the woman is Israel. Um, there's a, you know, the reason I believe that is, you know, a few chapters before when it talks about. Uh, the 144,000 Jews from every tribe, they were sealed, they were protected. And I believe the woman is protected. Um, and the, the rest of the offspring, the rest of the offspring t- depicts those who hold to the testimony of Jesus that the dragon persecuted. And I believe those are the rest of the, of the, of the body, um, the rest of the church. And so, so then that, that ends and it goes into Revelation 13 when Satan physically comes, he's physically on the earth. And he, he, he possesses the Antichrist. And then, in Revelation 14, we, we get another description of a group in heaven. And it talks about this group. There, you know, again, it mentions 144,000, but it's not the 144,000 Jews as it uh, was talking about you know, a few chapters before. Um, and you know, that number is not a specific number, meaning like, Okay, there's you know one person left. They you know we're at one thousand, you know, one hundred and forty three thousand nine hundred and ninety nine. There's one person left. That's not what it's talking about. You know that number. Um, I know Brian mentioned this in his notes. You know the number twelve represents government. You know, and so if you think twelve times twelve times you know a thousand in the millennial kingdom is basically talking about governmental authority. Um, and that goes aligned with, you know, about ruling the nations with a rod of iron. Um, and so when it's describing, you know, this, is, this, is where, this is where Revelation 14, the reason I, I think it's probably the strongest case that the man-child are, are the overcomers is because of Revelation 14. In Revelation 14, it describes this group that was just caught, it says, they are the first fruits Okay, first fruits. Does anybody know what first fruits are? All right, well, guess what? I'm going to tell you. Um, first fruits, anytime you have a harvest, the first fruits are, guess what? The first part of the harvest. Um, and, and, they're, and they're small in number. They may not be as, as you know, robust or what, uh, whatnot. Um, but after that comes the, the larger harvest. So they're small. Um, so it talks about these being the first fruits. Um, it talks about they were not defiled with women. They kept herself pure. There was no lie found in their mouth. They followed the lamb wherever he went. Um, it says that they were purchased. They were purchased from the earth. So let's think about that for a minute. If I go and I buy something from you, let's say I buy something from dad, I um, give him money. And what does he do? He, he, he takes it, right? He takes the money and gives me something back. So in other words, they were taken. You know, they were taken from the earth. Who was just taken from the earth? Two chapters before, the man-child. Um, and if you, you know, then why would they use the word taken? Well, taken, I think, can, can denote a negative context, like they were taken away. No, they were purchased. There was value. It was a tremendous value of the Lord. And so um, they were purchased from the earth. The other thing is they had the name of God on their forehead. So if we look back at Revelation uh, 3, 2 or 3, a church of Philadelphia, um, it, it, it talks about the name of God written on their forehead. But guess what else it talks about? It says that you will be kept from this hour of testing. Um, so here, to kind of recap this, we see a group of people the first fruits of God, who are characterized by um, following the Lord wherever he went, loving not their life, even unto death, the word of their testimony, 
and the blood of the Lamb. They, they overcame Satan, says they overcame him by the blood, loving not their life, and the word of their testimony. Does anyone know what the word life there is? You know, we've, we know in the Greek there's multiple versions of the word life, right? Does anybody know what version was used there? Soul, right. It's the soul life. It says they love not their soul life even unto death. Um, and I know that if you don't love your soul life into, into death, that actually, you know, can mean if you don't love your soul life, you're, you're not too concerned about your physical life either. Um, you know, but they, so that's, those are characteristics of this group. Now they, they're caught up. Satan is then cast to the earth, right? So in other words, they overcame Satan. They overcame him. Um, and then the rest of the ones who didn't overcome, who overcome, who they were persecuted by the enemy. And it's interesting, in, in, when it talks about the Church of Philadelphia, you know, they had little power. They didn't have, um, they didn't have a lot, but they persevered. And, you know, their perseverance, they were kept from the hour of testing. You know, so, you know, it's not about being, you know, this great person in the natural. It's about, you know, this, this simple devotion, you know, to the Lord. Um, and if we look, you know, back at the original, original purpose, the original intent, um, you know, we know that the son wants a bride, you know, the father of family, the spirit of the temple. Um, you know, but we look in the garden, and the original mandate that Adam was given was to, um, to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it. You know, he was supposed to take dominion over the serpent, and he failed to do so. You know, and God, he, you know, on the cross, you know, Christ legally defeated Satan, but why is Satan still around? Because the, ch the church is going to be, you know, through Christ, the one who overthrows. You know, if, if, you know, if God didn't want it that way, he would have already caused, you know, Satan's demise. Um, you know, but it's interesting that what was meant to be a serpent and was unchecked and was not dealt with is now a dragon. You know, there's another principle there, which we won't get into, but basically, you know, deal with things when they're small. I mean, look at that in our nation and how, like, you know, we've, we failed to... Um, address certain things, and now they're, you know, ballooning in our face. Um, you know, so, but Adam was a type of Christ. It says that in Romans, Adam was a type of Christ. You know, just as the bride came out of, uh, came out of Adam, he was put to sleep on the side, you know, the bride of Christ comes out of Christ. You know, when he was, when he was um, stabbed in the side, you know, it talks about that in, in Ephesians about, you know, we, we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. The bride of Christ is. Um, so when we look at, you know, we go back to the fall, look at the fall, right? There's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, the serpent said, if you eat of this, you'll become like me or come like God. But in other words, but what really happened is we became like the nature. We became like Satan. We, 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 we took on his nature, you know, and what are, what are characteristics of his nature? You know, self-consciousness. Self was dominant. Um, you know, we see that in we see that in immediately after they were self-conscious. You know, it's a self, self, self. Um, also, you know, knowledge, they, that's when they got knowledge. If you think about it, like we were never meant to have, to have knowledge. It was life-based, right? Um, you know, you look at creation. When God created, it was just his, the life that came out of him. It wasn't, I don't think he was sitting there calculating every detail. It was just, he just spoke it and the life that was in him did it. You know, um, Daniel says in the last days that knowledge will increase. It's, it's the, the, the seed of, of the enemy increasing. Um, you know, knowledge in the age to come will cease. You know, Paul says that in, um, in, Corinth, in 1 Corinthians. And, you know, not that knowledge is bad. We, knowledge is part of, the, you know, this earth. But it, it, being life-based is what supersedes, uh, supersedes knowledge. Um, you know, so 
when we look at, so we ha- now we have the context. We see, okay, the overcomers, the overcomers in, uh, in Revelation. Now, like, how, what are some practical things? Like, how do we become, you know, an overcomer? Um, you know, and if we look at, if, if we go through the characteristics, which, we, which we'll go through in a little more detail, um, you know, we have the letters to the seven churches. So we have, you know, during that time, there were a lot more than seven churches. There were probably thousands of churches. So why these seven churches? Why were these seven churches pointed out? Um, and I believe the reason they were, because they, they, all seven represented the body at whole, right? Um, they had certain ch- characteristics and certain traits that would represent the body at whole, not only in that time, but throughout all history. And so, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. So every single one of those churches represents something that we have, um, that, that is going on today. And you, if you go through and you read them, and we all, we all have read them, you would, we would see that. Um, you know, so that, that's number one. Number two is they overcame by the blood of the lamb, okay? The blood of the lamb is basically... Like, there is nothing of self. Like, there is no, there's no amount of good works. There's no amount of righteousness. There's no amount of, of us doing anything that can, um, you know, that can have any value for redemption. It's only the blood of the lamb. There is no self. Again, what's the nature of the dragon? Self. What's the nature of Christ? The nature of the lamb? Sacrifice. The blood of the lamb. Um, it, you know, when you look at, in, I think it's Revelation 4 or 5, no one was worthy, no one was worthy to open the seals. No one had, no one was found worthy except the lamb who was slain, the blood of the lamb. Um, you know, and we look in, you know, some examples, you know, in, in Scripture about, you know, it talks about being poor in spirit. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, being like seeing God and seeing his requirement and being like, there's nothing I can do about that, you know, and the mourning that comes from that. And God said, you know, you're blessed if you're like that because it's not about you. It's about his blood. You know, I look at the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, he was one of great wealth, but he couldn't, he, he couldn't give it up. And so the apostles were like, well, who, if they can't do it, then how is it possible? And Christ said, you know, with God, all things are are possible. So in other words, you know, it wasn't, it was, he was supposed to just lay it down and follow and allow the Lord to do, to give him the grace and the power to do it. It wasn't about, you know, his living a righteous life because he did. It was about following Christ. It was about leaving everything behind and, and following Christ you know, it's by faith. Um, you know, the next one is the word of our testimony. Um, you know, this kind of goes along with buying oil. If you think about what is a testimony? A testimony is something God's done in your life. Well, how can we overcome by our testimony? Are, are we overcome by our testimony by seeing God work in our life? Day after day, year after year, decade after decade, we, be, we get a history in God when he's overcome through us, through, our, through doing something in us. They're small things. They're not, I mean, yeah, there are some big things in there, but majority of them are small. And if you go back and you look over however many years you've been walking with the Lord and you were to count them up, a lot of them we probably have forgotten. Like, we know God's faithfulness by ha- him being faithful. And so we overcome by having that history in God. You know, it also speaks of intimacy with the Lord. You know, our, our word of our testimony, um, you know, speaks of intimacy. Now, you know, we, we love not our, our, our life, even unto death. We love not our soul life. We're not, we're not, you know, going back to, you know, looking at the Beatitudes and, you know, the Sermon, the sermon on the Mount. What did it say? It, you know, it said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. The Sermon on the Mount is basically the, the uh, war against the self-life. It is the nature of the Lamb. You know, being poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit is not 
achieving. It's recognizing the great need that we have. Mourning is seeing the great need and desiring God to do in us what he desires. You know, gentleness is not being passive. You know, a little story here. I was reading Evan's report card, and it said that he was gentle. And I'm like, that must be the school version of, of, of Evan, because the house version of Evan is William Wallace yelling, doing war against the British with a loud, violent voice. Um, but he is gentle. He's a gentle. He has a gentle spirit. You know, and be very careful whenever you have children, what you name them, because they will take upon the names. Evan means young warrior, noble protector, and he is a warrior. Like you watch Braveheart, William Wallace. That is my son right there. Um, you know, Ellie, Eliana. Her name means God has answered my prayer. You know why God has answered her prayer? Because she's the most persistent person on the planet. She does not be quiet, and she will just keep going and going and going and going, and hey, God has answered her prayer. She's an, I know she'll be an intercessor one day. Um, <laughs> hunger, <laughs> hunger and thirst for righteousness, having that desire for, for righteousness. You see, it's not about, it's not about being, being grace to be able to, you know, be disciplined to do something external. It's, it's an internal posture of the heart to hunger, to be merciful, to be pure in heart, to be peacemakers. A peacemaker is not a pacifist. A peacemaker, um, you know, sometimes peace requires hard things or war. Um, and it's, you know, blessed that are those who, who are persecuted. Um, Sermon on the Mount, anger, you know, lust, revenge. Revenge is a big one. You know, we, we live in a culture of, of anger and, and, you know, people want revenge, but, you know, the nature of the lamb is not to revenge. It's not to make false vows. It's to love our enemies. It's not practicing our righteousness to be seen by others, not being super spiritual, you know, being, just being real, being, you know, who God created you to be. Um, it's not living in the temporal. It's not, it's, it's living for eternity. It's not judging others. You know, this is a big one. You know, um, you know, just we have a tendency to look at other people through our, the lens of our life from our perspective. And, you know, just an example, let's say you're at work and let's say a guy comes, you know, a guy, one of your coworkers comes in and he has a tone, has an attitude, and he says something to you and, and, and immediately a fence begins to kind of like, why are you saying that to me? Like, why are, you know, you kind of kind of say, kind of get at him a little bit. But what you don't see, you don't see what's going on in his life behind the scenes. We don't see, you know, his wife has cancer. His son has special needs. He's up all hours of the night. He's incredibly depressed. He was on his way in the work. Traffic was terrible. Someone almost ran him off the side of the road. When he got to work, he forgot his laptop, and then he had to go all the way home. We don't see all that. We just see the little iceberg. And so, we need that context. Whenever, there, whenever the enemy wants to come and, and cause us to judge others, like we, we need to ask the Lord, Lord, show us what they're, what they're going through. You know, the na so the nature, that's the nature of Christ. Well, the nature of the dragon is the accuser, right? It's the exact opposite, which we'll get, in, get into in a second. Um, the next one, they followed the lamb wherever he went. And this is one of my favorites. You know, it's not about accomplishing and being this like, super, you know, Christian. It's about following Christ wherever he goes. You know, we, Dad and I were talking uh, a few weeks ago about, you know, there, there's, there's a few moments in your life that are big where God wants you to do a step of faith. And a lot of those don't come that often, um, but they require a, lot of st a huge step of faith. Um, sometimes they're smaller, but as we, as we do that, like that's, 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 you know, we're putting our hearts to the Lord. It's not us creating things. It's us being obedient and following, following Christ. Um, you know, Abraham, it says that he believed God and it, he was be created righteous because of that. So righteousness was directly attributed to him following the Lord. 
You know, it wasn't some doctrine that he had to, like, quote over himself, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. No, it was he followed the Lord, it was, and he wasn't a perfect person. He had some issues, but it was his heart was for God, and he followed him. Um, you know, now overcoming the nature of the dragon. You know, Satan's name. Does anyone know what Satan means in Hebrew? Anyone? The accuser. The accuser, and it says, the accuser of our brethren has been cast down. Um, you know, we, there, are, there are three types of accusation. There are when the enemy accuses us, or sorry, accuses us about God. Basically, he puts a wrong, um, a wrong nature of God in our minds, like a, like a false nature. Um, there's when we accuse ourselves. And then there's when we accuse others. And I think, I think this is the progression. I think it starts where, you know, we have an act, we, where God is assaulted in our mind, our, our, where we, we're mad at God for whatever. You know, that's the enemy. And I think there comes a time when we, we grow and mature and believe, and we don't believe that anymore. Where we're not mad at God. But then, you know, we, it turns to ourself, where, you know, we're, we're, we don't feel adequate, or we're not good enough, and we're not, um, you know, righteous enough, or whatever. And the enemy will accuse us, and he'll accuse us. And again, what is like? Take us back to the blood of the lamb. It's not about you. It's not about us. It's about his blood. And then lastly is others. And I think this is where, you know, once once we've arrived at the place where we don't really accuse God, and we're not accusing ourselves then it's, it's in others where, you know, like the example of the person at work or, um, you know, our friends or, or, or whatever, where, you know, we need to be those, whenever accusation comes in our mind towards someone, you know, it goes along with judging too, is we need to pause and, you know, and ask the Lord, you know, for his, for his perspective, for his grace. Um, you know, we, wanna, we don't want to be those who are filled with, you know, these things. We want to be, we want to, you know, have the nature of the Lamb. We want to follow the Lord wherever He goes. You know, we want to be, um, you know, we want to be conformed into His image. You know, it says in Romans that we want to, we want to outdo one another in showing honor. You know, so when we, when we kind of put all these together, the nature of the Lamb is, is selflessness. It's, it's that simple. It's selflessness. The nature of the dragon is self, right? Um, you know, so this year, God wants us to get a divine seriousness. Um, you know, I think, you know, looking back at, um, you know, Noel, you know, one thing, you know, Noel used to say is, you know, divine seriousness. Divine seriousness is the grand master key of progress. Um, you know, he doesn't want us to aimlessly go through life. He wants us to have vision for our life. But the vision, you know, it talks about in Proverbs that if you don't have vision, you're unrestrained. You know, and think about a horse who's unrestrained. They're all over the place, and they're not doing anything. They're not accomplished. They're just from running around. You know, but if you're a horse that's restrained, there's a purpose. There's a, there's a beauty. There's a, you know, there's, there's, there, there's a meaning for that, Right. And he wants us to be restrained, and, but restrained by the vision of being an overcomer. There's no other greater thing in life than to be part of that. I mean, think about, like, the, the whole history of God coming to the culmination. We, have a, we can be a part of that. We can be part of the, of the company that the... the the, the achievement of everything God has, has done since creation, we can be the, the people who usher that in. Because no matter how dark, how gloomy, how evil the world gets, Christ will not come back until there's enough people who will make up the first fruits of the overcomers. And once that happens... That's when the kingdom begins to come. That's when Satan is cast down. Satan is cast from heaven 
to the earth. And it's interesting, when Jesus said that, I know I saw Satan fall like lightning, I used to read that and thinking like, okay, it was right then, or I was in the past, but I don't think so. I think he was speaking to the future. This event here, Satan was cast like lightning. Um, in Isaiah 14, it just picks Lucifer. It says, you were cast to the earth. I think this is that event he's talking about. You know, there's a group of people that God is raising up who will be the catalyst for that. Now, the beauty, the beauty of that is that's not, all, that's not the entire overcomer. That's just a few, the first fruits. The, the rest will become most likely overcomers because there's going to be some tremendous persecution. So after this event, if you're not an overcomer, guess what? You get another chance. Um, but it's going to be intense persecution. It's going to be you have the, the great wrath of, of Satan on the earth, you have the wrath of God against Satan, so he's going to be, you know, he's going to come and, you know, just bring a lot of, you know, uh, destruction upon the body of Christ at that time. And when we read in Revelation 14, you know, the same chapter about, we, you know, we read about the first fruits, it talks about, you know, those who are on the earth um, not taking the mark of the beast. Um, because if you take the mark of the beast, you'll be thrown into the lake of fire. And he says, this is the perseverance of the saints. So it's interesting that the person, you know, if, if you're not part of the first fruits, there's perseverance that you have to learn. In, Re in the Church of Philadelphia, what were they commended for? Their perseverance. So I believe, you know, achieving a level of perseverance, God, only God knows. God knows the level of perseverance he knows the yes in our spirit. He knows, um, are, we, are we truly following him wherever he goes? And if we're not, when that event happens, well, guess what? You get a chance to do it again. This is going to be probably more intense. Um, you know, but we want to be, be part of those people. And again, if we're, you know, if we're not part of the, the first fruits, you know, we'll be part, hopefully part of the second part of that. Um, but it's very serious. It's a very serious thing. If we're not intentional about it, and intentional doesn't mean we're doing things. It's the attitude of our heart. It's the desires of our heart. Like when we get, ex like what gets you excited? You know, what gets us motivated? Like what do we think about it? Is it this? Is it the Lord? If it's not, ask, you know, this is what this year needs to be. It needs to be, it needs to be a year of really, focusing on us. Like, this has been the desire of my heart for many, or not many years, several years. You know, and it's not a duty. It's a, it's a, like, it's a hobby. Like, it's, it's, it's something that I love. I don't like, okay, I'm going to discipline myself. To, to, yeah, there is discipline when you don't want to judge someone and you want to, like, wring their neck and you restrain yourself. Yes, there is discipline there, and that's not what I'm talking about. But the joy of the Lord, you know, to have that desire to follow after him. And, you know, the big thing is we don't want anyone to steal our crown. And, you know, in Revel, in, actually, let's, let's read it real quick. Let's read about the Church of Philadelphia. And as, as we read this, think about what we talked about for, you know, the overcomers mentioned in Revelation 14. There's, there's so many parallels. It says to the it says Revelation three seven to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, he who is holy who is true, who has the key um, of David, who opens and no one will shut and shuts and no one will open. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have little power. Okay, it's not about great you know displays of of strength. You have little power. Okay, again, you have kept my word. You have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, those who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Okay, because you have kept the word of my perseverance. That's a key word, perseverance. I will also keep you from the hour of testing which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Again, they're taken away. I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Very important. No one will take your crown. 
we're responsible. No one can take our crown. What does that mean? It means your children, your spouse, you're responsible for yourself. Don't let anyone steal God's destiny for you. You know, Jesus said our relationship with him should be as though we hate other people. Not that we hate our brothers and our sisters, but our love for him is such a high level that it would be like hating, you know, those in your relationship to don't let anybody steal your crown. Um, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar of the temple of my God. He will not go out from it any longer, and I will write upon the name of the Lord and the city of my God and the city of Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven, my God, and my new name. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So read over this, you know, in this coming week is, you know, Revelation 3, 12, 13, and 14. Um, you know, God wants us to be, to be aligned in this. Um, you know, again, not, not everybody's going to do that. Um, you know, but we want to be, we want to be those who, who make our life's vision, our life's goal is to have the nature of the lamb and to not have the nature of the dragon. You know, I know a, a accusation is a, is a really big deal. Um, and I remember early on in my walk, it was, um, I remember going through the dark nights, you know, the soul, there was that, that accusation against, you know, in your mind against God, like, why God would you allow, you know, these, these hard things to go on? Um, you know, and we, and that's human nature, human nature, we don't see the divine perspective on things. Um, that doesn't mean that we be passive and we allow everything that comes against us to, you know, to defeat us. But, you know, we, we need to su submit to God. We need to surrender to him not, and not allow the enemy to, to spew his, his evil in our minds. Um, and the same about self. Like, God really wants us to get over, you know, feeling self-condemned, feeling, um, feeling unworthy, uh, feeling that, that sense of hopelessness, um, you know, and I, I can tell you, is, you know, one through who has gone through, who has gone through, you know, trials and come through now again, like, you know, what was my, path, what was my score? I don't know, but it, you know, I didn't get an A, I'll tell you that. Um, but, you know, seeing God, seeing God of, you know, having perseverance, not quitting, following the Lord, when it was a very difficult decision to do. And there's been many a time. There's not just, it's not like a one-time thing. There's been many things where, you know, God will show you, you know, five feet in front of you and you go and it's like, okay, you got a, another step of faith and another step of faith. But then you look back and you're like, I'm too far into this now. I can't quit. You know, you got to go on. And as we begin to do that and do that more, there's like, it's joy, like it begins to where you have joy and joy and joy, and it creates a, the, the inward life becomes um, stronger and stronger and stronger where we have, you know, we, we become those people who are not offended, who have tremendous amount of faith, who have, um, th if anything happens, it doesn't phase us. Now, are we there? No, some of us may be closer than others. Um, you know, but it, it comes by when we go through those hard times, not, not quitting, following the Lord. Because um, I can tell you, like, this perseverance is going to come. Like, if it, we either learn it now or we'll learn it as it gets harder. Um, and just as, you know, the serpent wasn't dealt with and it became a dragon, the things that we need to persevere now are very minor in comparison to what will come. You know, so let's be people who, who have the resolve this year to really pursue the Lord and to, to put in our hearts that we are going to be those who, who are pursuing the overcoming lifestyle, not, not, in, not in flesh, not in doing, but in a desire of the heart and in taking on the nature of the lamb and in, and in identifying the nature of the dragon in our heart and 
and, and, and dealing with that. Um, amen. Thank you.